Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of the India Idea Week. Uh, today's panel discussion uh, revolves, resort, revolves around resolving technology and IP related disputes across all industry sectors, the AAA ICDR way. Before we begin with the session, I would like to invite Asta, uh, who is the director uh, for the Asia uh, CMC of AAA ICDR. Briefly about Asta, uh, prior to her stint with AAA ICDR, she was a counsel and practitioner in Indian courts. She has the unique opportunity to uh, draw from her experiences in litigation and dispute resolution and to sort of help uh, the AAA ICDR process. Uh, Asta, over to you. Peace. Good afternoon, everyone. I believe there are many of us who are yet to join. The lunch was pretty good, <laughs> I believe. So uh, we are here for AAA ICDR as a part of India ADR Week. And I would just, before I start, by show of hands, how many of you have heard about AAA ICDR? And how many have? been a part of a AAA ICDR arbitration or a mediation? Some. So we are doing some work, some good work, some success we've seen. So if I can introduce AAA ICDR to the ones who have not heard, AAA ICDR has been a pioneer in the field of dispute resolution for decades. Although it will be much easier for me to say that AAA ICDR is nearly 100 years old, however, I would like to say that we are 7 million cases old. Don't be surprised, it includes our domestic caseload as well. When it comes to our international caseload, it is around 700 to 1,000 one year, in a year. Now, while I was preparing for this talk, I came across a study which talks about what are the three main challenges that, are, that we face in technology litigation. It's cost, time in resolution, and third is the inexperienced and unqualified decision makers for technology disputes. So clearly we see that there is a lack of subject matter expertise when we go take our disputes to litigation. Therefore, the best alternative, and now we do not want to use the word alternative anymore for arbitration because, because it has become the main dispute re resolution mechanism and technology disputes are on a rise. Now, if we go back to the origin of arbitration, in the Middle Ages, arbitration was a source or a mediation of resolving med medium of resolving disputes by the merchants and they also didn't want the legal experts to be resolving their disputes they wanted someone who was experienced in their industry to be resolving the disputes and safely we can say that bringing in subject matter expertise is one of the biggest benefits arbitration brings in now, to co counter this issue of inexperienced and unqualified decision makers, AAA ICDR has a specialized panel for technology experts as mediators and arbitrators. So when it comes to a technology dispute, we make sure that someone from the technology panel is appointed as a neutral. Now, if before we go into the appointment process, I would like to briefly share how an appointment is done with AAA ICDR. When a case comes to us, the case manager's first responsibility is to call both the parties, schedule an administrative conference, and ask the parties what are the qualification of the arbitrators that they are looking for. Once the parties submit their qualifications, the qualifications can be anything, nationality, subject matter expertise, language capabilities, technology capabilities, whatever the parties want to wish for. And these 
Qualifications are noted down by the case managers. We look for such qualifications in our panel arbitrators and mediators, and we send out a list of 10 to 15 arbitrators to the parties. The parties have the choice of either striking out the names that they receive, and the leftover names they can rank in order of their preference. Once they do the ranking, they bring back the list to the case manager, and accordingly, the best choice of the arbitrator as chosen by the parties is appointed, which eliminates the surprise element and also makes sure that the arbitrator who is deciding the dispute has the subject matter expertise. And that's what we are looking forward to improve on. Now, we have a stellar panel here, which will make sure that no one sleeps after the lunch. In any case, we have uh, coffee outside. And now I would uh, leave the discussion to the panel to take forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asta, for the introduction on the AAA ICDR mechanism and what it has to offer as a platform. Hope uh, the takeaway from here is also for all of us to sort of use the platform in our future disputes. Coming back to the panel, um, before going ahead with allowing the panel to discuss the issue, a uh, very relevant issue in my opinion given Bangalore is the tech hub, the tech capital of the country. Resolving tech and IP disputes through the arbitration process. I want to give a brief introduction of the panel for those who are not aware of the popular faces that are joining us today. Uh, Shreyas uh, Jaisima, uh, founder of Arna Law and co-founder of Simha Law, has 23 to 25 years of experience, is a trained arbitrator, is, uh, an, acts as an arbitrator, trained mediator, and also acts as a co-counsel counsel in major international and domestic arbitrations. He's a member of expert committees uh, constituted by the Ministry of Law, Just, Law and Justice in India, and in other several committees across arbitration institutions. Poonima Hati, uh, co-founder of Samvad Partners, again, has 20 years of experience acting as mediator and arbitrator and as counsels, uh, not only in arbitrations but also outside in the court process, is uniquely placed to give us insights on the practice outside court and inside court. Saurabh Avasti is the GC for Crindle India and was priorly uh, associated with IBM India. A tech uh, enthusiast uh, who's keenly invested and interested in uh, emerging technologies. We hope to hear a lot of insights from him on what is what what <coughs> goes on behind the screens when parties are considering the several options that exist for resolving their disputes. Ashish Kabra will be the moderator for this panel. Uh, is the head of uh, Nisit Desai and Associates Singapore. He himself has relevant experience in uh, representing MNCs tech companies specifically and pharma companies uh, in domestic and international arbitrations. Uh, he's also engaged with several clients in the TMT sector, which a part of team is involved in the uh, uh, panel discussion today. He's also a member, honorary <coughs> member of uh, Commercial Bar uh, Association Singapore, sorry, England and Wales, and is also a working group member of the Singapore uh, International Commercial Court. This panel, um, a very illustrious panel, and hope uh, all of us today will have a lot of questions to ask, pick their brains on the things that they would discuss in the course of our tradition, sorry, in the course of our panel discussion. Over to you, uh, Ashish. Thank you, Gautam, and thank you, Asta, for the introduction. Now, as the moderator for the post-lunch session, the first order of business is I see that the clock is at 81 minutes. I will reduce that time to straight 60 and try and sharply end in 60 minutes from now. So that's the first order. So you only need to concentrate for the next 60 minutes. Uh, they've already introduced the panelists who are here, and obviously they all have a stellar reputation. The topic that we are going to address or speak on is technology disputes and, effect and IP disputes and resolving them the AAA ICDR way. Now, we've all seen a whole host of different type of technology disputes, 
but each have a very different nuance and different way of handling them. But when we talk of arbitration, it has traditionally not been the way in which these disputes have been resolved, but there has been a change and a shift which is taking place. And in also the type of disputes where this, this shift is taking place or already we are down the path to resolving them through arbitration. But to simplify the discussion and to start the discussion for today, let me begin with a very basic question for the audience. And I'll address that to Purnima. Purnima, if you can just describe to us and help us understand what all do technology disputes effectively entail? Or what are the types of technology disputes that one comes across these days? Thanks, Ashish. Um, so I was just telling Ashish that we'll try and make this as interactive as possible, where a small group of people uh, feel free to interrupt us at any point of time, um, should you have something to add in. Uh, many faces in the audience have experiences in technology and intellectual property, so it'll be great to have it as a conversation. Um, so feel free to let us know if something has worked for you, something hasn't worked for you. Uh, we're all friends on the panel here, so it would be good to sort of take the conversation forward as opposed to sort of a one-way conversation. Um, so the reason I think it's important to identify technology disputes is uh, technology is such an interesting part of our lives today and anything that you touch can be categorized as a tech dispute. Um, so while you may have a tech m and or a tech joint venture, um, at least in my conversation today, I'm not going to focus on those as, as tech disputes. Uh, what we're going to look at, um, and traditionally, of course, there have been uh, collaborations uh, in the tech space, um, which involve time and cost and uh, certain milestones to be achieved. And, and when those are not met, um, what happens? Um, the reason why I'm looking at it in this context is, is of course, in some situations, tech and m &As and tech JVs and other collaborations uh, which have a contractual nature will um, have some implications on the nature of arbitrations or uh, dispute resolution mechanisms that we adopt. Uh, but if we focus purely on the tech subject matter, um, then we can look to see if we want certain expertise, as Asta was talking about, you know, who do we want as our arbitrators? Who do we want as our mediators? Um, do we have a certain profile? And where do we look towards these people? Um, and how do we achieve that goal? I think that's what I'm going to be looking at as, as tech. In terms of intellectual property, again, a wide, vast canvas. Um, do we want to talk about validity and arbitra arbitrability of IP disputes? Um, you know, for everything that is in a contractual context, in personem. So if Ashish and I enter into a contract about certain intellectual property rights, uh, then we can definitely go to arbitration. And because the creature, arbitration is a creature of the contract. But if it's something as wide as a, a domain name um, and we want an injunction from a court to make sure that it's not utilized specifically in, a, in an in personem context, then are we looking to ADR at all? Um, and what needs to be done in that context? So how much of intellectual property disputes can be utilized uh, in the ADR arbitration space? Obviously, because it's far more efficient, um, much more cost friendly compared to Indian courts, um, especially bearing in mind that intellectual property and technology can cover uh, you know, beyond border disputes, right? So it, tech is very international, so is intellectual property. Um, so how do we keep these two ideas uh, in, in the context of dispute resolution? I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, uh, you Purnima. Let me also bring in Saurabh here. Saurabh, you bring the in-house perspective on the panel here. <coughs> what are the types of disputes that you are seeing uh, in your line of work? Thanks, uh, Ashish. So, um, look, I think I was, while I was driving here to the venue, I was thinking, uh, you know, the, the kind of disputes that, that a tech company has, um, what is atypical about them? And, and why arbitration versus conventional dispute resolution? I think one of the things uh, one thought about always was complexity, but then uh, a number of my friends, including uh, some here on the panel, have uh, you know advised on fairly complex contracts. Let's say which deal with EPC or which deal with oil and gas, which are no less complex, right? So, what is unique about complexity in tech? I think it's because uh, 
the way tech has evolved in the last couple of decades is faster than anywhere else, right? So what tech meant earlier and then for the disputes around it has obviously changed with the nature of, uh, of how technology has evolved. To give you an example, um, you know, India saw a boom with uh, complex managed services tech contracts about uh, maybe 18, 20 years back. A lot of those contracts are now actually being read, right? Because you have clients who've now looked at continuous service over years together. And I think there are uh, contrasting sort of motivations for clients as well as uh, service companies in terms of, uh, you know, what are the efficiencies being drawn? What are the issues that come into play? Most of these are extremely complex uh, annuity type contracts. So therefore, there are issues that will come in on performance of these managed services contracts. Um, and I think the important part to remember is, unlike, uh, unlike a situation where you have a standalone service provider and substitutability is easy, you can't really change your managed service provider easily, right? So you've got to solve the problems, and if it's not going to work out when you talk to each other, then you've got to find an efficient way to resolve it and move on with the engagement. Uh, on the IP dispute side, uh, I think a number of, uh, you know, the India tech story is equally divided between innovation and IP development versus services, which is a very large part of, uh, of what's getting done here in India. I think IP disputes, for larger entities, large scale arbitration are relatively unheard of in India because I think more or less people are mindful of IP and their monetization and therefore they're extremely conservative around it. Uh, also in the startup ecosystem, you see a little bit more of uh, IP disputes, but for established service companies, I think lesser so, right? And then finally, of course, uh, one important reminder for this group is that uh, IT companies are the largest employers They've got a ton of people and resources. And uh, where you've got people, you will have problems. Uh, those could be employment disputes, which see lesser of, uh, of let's say, the need for a formal dispute resolution. But uh, take, for instance, large payouts. Take, for instance, uh, patents. Take, for instance, rights that people have when they've developed assets for companies. Uh, again, those are important disputes that come to play. Um, just to round off, I think we also are acquisitive as a sector. And I think inevitably with the acquisition comes the comes the process of working with us, trial shareholders, you've got payout related disputes, you've got management related disputes. So I suspect uh, the last two categories are perhaps generic across sectors and across industries. But I think the first two um, are really morphing really, really quickly. I think if you were to speak in five years time about what disputes we see, almost certainly you will you will hear the word AI. I haven't said that in a minute, uh, and I can't believe it because everybody keeps talking AI. So, so that's uh, that's where we are right now on the on tech disputes. Yeah, interesting observations there, Saurabh. Uh, Purnima, you mentioned about transactions in the uh, involving IP. Uh, there were the other set of disputes that you both mentioned about was related to the actual intellectual property, their validity, enforcement, ownership. Then we obviously are seeing new age issues coming up in the artificial intelligence space and so on. So Shreyas, given this background of the different types of disputes that our panelists just described, let me start with a threshold question. How do you see these disputes being amenable to arbitration, or rather, let me put it differently, do you consider that these disputes are arbitrable? Uh, thank you. If you speak to many of the in-house counsel, like uh, Saurabh here, they um, have for a long time in the tech space dis disliked arbitration and they have voted with their feet. If you look at the number of um, companies that have not had arbitration clauses, that have um, had them but with very few institutions, it's a very telling story and I don't think the arbitration world has been listening, especially to the tech companies telling us why this system does not work for them. So I think the arbitration world will do well for itself to take a pause and listen. So one part of it is the legality of it, which I will address in a minute. Um, but before getting into that, I wanted to say that the expectations of uh, commercial enterprises in the tech space um, are of a higher order in the sense that they need people who are able to be technically proficient, who are able to understand uh, with some degree of expertise, not only the, uh, the technology, but also the business implications and the domino effect that uh, an improper outcome can have.
can be severe and it can be severe not just on the outcome of one enterprise but because technology companies have become part of the core infrastructure something like banking you can, something that you can do not do without and therefore getting a wrong outcome let's say in a in a construction dispute might result in two unhappy parties might result in a wonky building or a bridge but getting a wrong outcome in a deep tech dispute will have a long lasting uh, negative outcome and i think that level of trust that the arbitration ecosystem can produce consistently uh, technically aware uh, commercially aware um, and pan pan arbitrators who can then uh, produce uh, fair outcomes um, is is a matter of trust building and therefore um, the arbitration world cannot demand respect it must earn it and command it having said this uh, the law has uh, certainly made space from uh, going to one one end of the pendulum to say that uh, if it is um, uh, disputes that impact uh, third parties uh, be it in the real estate context look what we saw in boozal and vidra drolia or more specifically in in ip there's been a certainly a clarification that large numbers of ip disputes are entirely arbitrable eros international uh, considered this in some detail in 2016 and most recently uh, we just jumped to the hero electric vehicles versus electro e mobility 2021 uh, decision where uh, the court uh, uh, understood and it actually went beyond just the facts of that particular case which was pertaining to uh, uh, infringement of a trademark but to also say that the uh, essential rights that were being claimed were not merely under the trademarks act but the infraction that was being alleged was also contractual and therefore the contractual breaches uh, were in fact the essential infractions being alleged between the parties and therefore they said it uh, falls well within uh, uh, the notion of arbitrable disputes of course the caution from vidya drolia still remains in the background that is if uh, there is a uh, if there are rights that are in person absolutely go ahead if there are rights and rem then again this test of what is the essential infraction uh, needs to be looked at uh, but a uh, good friend uh, and now recent senior counsel in chennai shrinath sridevan had a very interesting take on this uh, case last month in chennai uh, where he said that this um, analysis of those three or four tests that came in vidya drolia is actually incorrect according to him and i uh, uh, leave it i don't want to steal his thunder I want to fully acknowledge his input, and I'm sure he'll uh, have a short article on it soon. So that is, I think, where it is. We need to earn our respect in this field. Now, I take your point that arbitration needs to earn its respect to be the chosen mechanism for tech companies for resolving their disputes. And I believe we are making stride towards it, as you mentioned earlier. AAA ICDR having a specialized panel is a step in that direction. but on the threshold question of arbitrability of these disputes you mentioned that the indian courts have gone ahead and found uh, these disputes to be arbitrable you mentioned about the delhi high court judgment and hero Elec hero electric case and it was in interesting because typically intellectual property disputes about the the disputes regarding their validity and ownership they they are con considered to be dealing with rights in rem and are not considered as amenable to arbitration however subordinate rights arising from these rights in rem can be truly arbitrated and that that's what the delhi high court there said and that's where the position now as it stands but as you mentioned earlier again on arbitration commanding its uh, its position as being the preferred mechanism let me come back to sorab sorab he, he was mentioning about technology companies and i let me put the question to you differently as from being in a technology company what do you see or believe that are the advantages of having arbitration as a means of resolving disputes i know shreya said that we need to uh, earn our respect i am putting the question inversely to you coming from the technology space as to what do we do to uh, or what do you feel is how arbitration can be useful for tech companies in resolving their disputes yeah um look i think uh, you know 
a number of, uh, of sort of companies like ours, and I speak in my personal capacity, but a number of tech companies which are hosted outside, uh, you know, um, promoters, uh, investors, Regulators are convinced that uh, that the the adjudication process with courts is is slow, is unwieldy, is is uh, is, uh, is problematic because there are idiosyncrasies at different high courts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? I think I think the the pitch that we made, right, and I, I, you know, partially it's true, but partially it isn't, is that we wanted a certainty of process. We wanted domain experts who understand what we do because it is, uh, it is fairly niche. Uh, we thought that this would be efficient from a timing standpoint and a cost standpoint. I go back, uh, most of us are uh, similar age here on the panel, uh, you not included Ashish, but you know when we were first year or second year associates, the number of notes we've written to our international clients about why arbitration was preferable, right? If you remember those compared to, compared to going to courts. But clearly, you know, some of that hasn't unfolded the way we wanted it to. Um, I find, for instance, that uh, there is uh, some lack of amplification in terms of uh, choices around arbitration. Most of us end up going ad hoc, and that's because we're not really well informed in terms of what capabilities different chambers bring in. Um, so I think events like this help, number one. Number two is that uh, there's got to be more active engagement uh, to be able to, for instance, sense, uh, let me just take two minutes to give you something specific, right? So we have a conventional structure where tech companies are system integrators. Uh, they work as intermediaries between clients and then a, a host of software and service providers. They essentially gather and integrate the entire suite of services and then deliver them to the client as an outcome. Now, if there was a dispute, given that there are back-to-back -back relationships, uh, it would ideally need somebody to understand uh, how that backstopping works. Uh, what is the concept of privity? Because there are very strong accounting concepts around gross transactions versus net, depending on what value the system integrator brings. Uh, so it's, all, it's, you know, I've just sort of pointed out two things for 10 seconds, and it's already started to get uh, intense. Uh, somebody needs to be able to drill down into that level of intensity at the arbitral proceedings. Um, we've of course found that you know that's been a that's been a bit of a challenge. It's been checkered. I won't say that uh, Shreyas, it's been entirely uh, off key, but uh, but more often than not, we found that in the balance, uh, you know, the assurances that we gave about speed and efficiency around resolution are simply not there. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but the net of what I'm saying is we're looking for. Uh, domain expertise and not somebody who's just understood the domain and then just sits on it. None of us do with technology. You've got to keep uh, staying current. We're looking for certainty of process. And I think costs uh, aren't that's that much of a challenge if uh, one is assured efficiency. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, what one would like to see. So Purnima, let me follow you f up with you on what Saurabh was just mentioning. How do we then how can or how does arbitration, if it already does, ad address some of these challenges or some of these areas that tech company are looking into? And if, so, if addressed or if already a solution is available, they would increasingly adopt ad arbitration as their means of resolving dispute. He said about certainty, speed and efficiency. Are there other factors also at play? So where do you think the arbitration as it stands currently in answering some of these issues or areas that technology companies look into? Well, I don't think arbitration addresses all of what Saurabh is um, asking for, and, and those are reasonable asks. It's not like, um, you know, he's asking for everything else. And these are conversations that we're having regularly, you know, how, how can we improve, um, you know, the ecosystem that we're all a part of, and, and how do we make this move forward? Um, so let me give you an example, and I, it's also interesting what Shreya said in terms of, you know, how do we command respect, and, and how do we make sure that uh, even let's say if it's an ad hoc arbitration and, and, and you know, say Shreyas and I are sitting as arbitrators, how do we make sure then that, you know, we do really measure up to everything, say, IBM or Kindrel wants and, and then how do we do that? Um, so we were, actually, we had a, a dispute where we were acting for an international tech company. Um, interestingly, there was a mediation clause. And on the other side was um, a government entity, uh, the government of a state in India, 
And what really excited me was the fact that we had a mediation clause in a government dispute. You don't really see that uh, um, because no one officer will want to say, I settled this dispute at this value and then you know, have a hundred questions asked, you know, this could have gone up. Why don't you just go to court and get a judgment? Uh, or why didn't you get a tribunal? Um, but the fact that, A, we had the mediation clause was very, very interesting. But the point is, once the process started of this tiered dispute resolution clause, there was mediation, expert determination, and then arbitration. Um, we were unable to appoint a mediator of our choice. Um, and because, as Saurabh said, there was a continuing engagement, they couldn't replace us because there was a long historical health tech ongoing issue. Um, so, you know, we couldn't be replaced. Uh, we were not getting money. Uh, we were not getting the client's attention. Um, but, well, ultimately they had a mediator of their choice who knew little or nothing about health or tech. Um, so, uh, you know, that mediation rapidly failed despite, mm, you know, a lot of effort from our client. We then moved to expert determination, same story again, um, and finally we are now in arbitration. So despite an excellent tiered dispute resolution clause, the process failed because one party was was not willing to engage the way it was conceptualized, right? So, uh, so we have to read the room in terms of who are the parties involved? Uh, and big tech in India will have to engage with the government in some form or the other, uh, or state entities. Um, so are we all in an ecosystem where each of us is mature enough to say, this is a bunch of neutral people, or let's go to AAA ICDR, or you know, whoever else, and say, let them then appoint from a set of you know, arbitrators that they have, who would then resolve your dispute. Um, I think there has been progress. I want to pick up on the thread from the previous conversation on mediation and ODR. I think we're already there. There's a lot of conversation that's happening. Uh, we're moving rapidly in that direction. Uh, and there's some good mediators and good arbitrators, but sector-specific expertise is something that we still have to build a lot more. Um, and when, when that happens, I think uh, the asks of the industry will be met. But we have to work together as an ecosystem. I, I don't think uh, a bunch of us or only the institutions will make a difference. And, and this is for anything, right? I mean, uh, diversity uh, on the arbitration panel is a pet project of mine. We don't see enough women arbitrators. Why not? Uh, because everybody wants a gray-haired man, preferably a retired high court judge or a Supreme Court judge on the panel. Uh, so, you know, how do we make that needle move forward? So these are conversations that we continue to sh uh, have and should have. So it, it is really our collective responsibility uh, to make this happen. What about certain other factors, and again to you, things like confidentiality or cross-border enforcement? How critical or otherwise not so critical do you think these factors are in context of tech companies and tech disputes? So I'm taking those as, as a given. Right? confidentiality, uh, choosing the person who has the tech expertise, um, the fact that you could control it, the fact that it's not going to be on the evening news. Um, these are things that we've now accepted. Uh, cost we've not expe expected, but as, as Saurabh said, people are willing to put good money if they feel that the process will, will result somewhere. I think what is exciting, again, I'm going to go back to the tiered dispute resolution clause, is preserving relationships. So. Uh, I know AAA ICDR now has an opt-out mediation clause. Interesting. So you opt out of mediation, you don't opt in. Uh, and the reason that's there is mediation can give you very, very creative outcomes, uh, not necessarily legal outcomes, right? We can then say, let's settle this, but we'll have five other projects we'll work on together. Or, you know, why don't you do some other training or do some other collaboration, which is not going to happen in arbitration or in court, right? So. I think there is movement and creativity over there, um, but we have to still take it forward. So I think confidentiality, time and cost, while continuing to remain concerns, uh, we have sort of other challenges to cross. You, you mentioned about AAA ICDR having mediation in, in their rules, and their rules are fairly unique in that sense and allow for an easy transition between mediation and arbitration. So from a technology disputes perspective, when you think the role that a mediation can play, I think these set of rules also sort of enable that. Uh, Shreyas, coming to you uh, in this context, are there other provisions within the institutional framework, institutional rules that are there, in particular AAA ICDR uh, set of rules, 
which can be capitalized by technology companies or which may be used in some of the tech disputes to achieve some of these you know, uh, areas or concerns that tech, tech disputes are having or to sort of resolve them. For example, cost, speed, and efficiency. Uh, thanks. I, I do want to say that in this skepticism that um, I pointed out on tech companies, the AAA ICDR does stand out as being one of those exceptions that proves the rule. Um, I've been part of um, processes in the US, other places, um, and there's a reason why uh, AAA ICDR has uh, kind of led the curve. Uh, I'll begin with uh, what is kind of perhaps might have hit your um, mobile screens in recent times, which is crypto disputes. So if you look at crypto disputes, you look at Asta's office in um, uh, in Singapore, you, know, you have um, matters that are going on between founders of crypto funds, their tar their portfolio companies, and you can see for yourself uh, the rules that are being chosen uh, for, for such disputes. If you look at the statistics of tech disputes only, there is about uh, 1.1 billion, and billion can be written in many ways. This is billion written uh, with uh, three digits of uh, millions after that. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge amount of uh, uh, money, and people are voting with their feet for the set of rules. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting for us to consider why. Apart from the opt-out mediation process, um, Asta, you may think it, this AAA ICDI was the first to create uh, um, the emergency arbitration, but my memory, if served correctly, was that it was Stockholm uh, Chamber of Commerce. You can slug it out. Okay, all right. <laughs> so when, I, when I was in Stockholm, they claimed to be the first. So I haven't verified it, but amongst the first for sure, uh, in, in having the emergency process. And that is a creative um, uh, you know, uh, sub, uh, response to the demand for speed, demand uh, for uh, creativity in having, making sure that uh, uh, you do more than just the usual process. And now, uh, as I said on the committee to uh, redraft portions of the Arbitration Act, it's become such an uh, expected element of uh, an arbitral ecosystem of any seat. And this was not the case uh, just a couple of decades ago. Also, there are other rules on expedited uh, procedures uh, as well, uh, which support also uh, technology uh, and IP disputes. And the, I must also come into the attention of the audience uh, some of the notes and practical guides that the Institute has developed. For example, there's a ICC, uh, sorry, uh, AAA practical guide on drafting dispute resolution clauses. Um, and uh, they classify it in different uh, formats. One is uh, arbitration of future disputes, arbitration of existing disputes, which can be looked at to many uh, cases which are currently already uh, perhaps in different rules as well, but then want to opt out, opt into the AAA ICDR ecosystem. And there are also um, um, specific clauses that can be incorporated, uh, looking to um, appoint experts of technology or IP uh, um, experts. And there are also some sample clauses for uh, preliminary uh, relief. Uh, I, m I must also quickly mention that there is a platform that they have also created, uh, which is an online platform uh, for resolution of uh, any dispute that's not limited to tech. And that's a, I must also mention the generosity of uh, ICDR. We all know the success of SIAC. But if you look into who is the, the institution that mentored SIAC to become the roaring success that it is in Asia, you will find that it is this, the host of today's panel. And so the generosity of the Institute is to me striking, as just as an objective observer of the market. And even with the suite of uh, online products, um, again, it's, you're able to use it. Asa, correct me if I'm wrong. Even if you're not using the IC, uh, the uh, AAA rules, can you use the online platform or not? No. The online, yes. No, okay, you have to use it, okay. So maybe you might consider <laughs> You might consider that, uh, you know, in future times as well, because this interoperability between arbitral institutions is key. This is the key, and I would say this is also the market expectation. So that just as you are able to say others can opt into your rules, if again your suite of products can also be uh, taken advantage of with whatever uh, ad hoc or other procedures are going on, it will hugely uh, have a beneficial impact.
Thank you, Shreyas. And interesting points on the AAAI CDR rules and the online case management platform that's available. We have been discussing a fair bit about how we sort of use arbitration, some of the advantages and some of the challenges that you outlined in, ter in terms of what tech companies are looking. But procedurally or as a mechani mechanism in itself, are there any inherent limitations which arise when one adopts arbitration while trying for resolving technology disputes? Well, what's the alternative? What's the alternative you're comparing it against? If, so when you talk about limitation, there are, ob there are limitations to any uh, one of those buffet options. Litigation has its limitation, arbitration has its limitation, mediation has its very severe limitation in terms of it requires consent of parties before you can move ahead. So um, I think therefore focusing only on the limitations of arbitration is not looking at the full picture of the, of the options that are available. And we have to look at the shades of grey and in this, just as you say, democracy is the least worst form of government. In, in the technology space, it may well be that uh, uh, we need to rebrand and re, uh, re uh, ADR, not as alternate dispute resolution, but as appropriate dispute resolution. And so the same dispute, even a tech dispute, at an appropriate stage might have a litigation element that's relevant, might have an arbitration element that's relevant, and a mediation element that's, uh, that's relevant. So I would recommend uh, taking a very focused um, and bespoke uh, approach to each uh, situation and rather than branding one mode as being uh, better or worse than the other, especially when it comes to one industry or sector such as tech. That's my view. So do you have any other thoughts or perspectives on this? I would also consider areas such as we see in technology disputes, sometimes we need reliefs against third parties at an interim basis. I don't know what everyone's experience has been on side of document production in international arbitration. We see the current approach is fairly limited in terms of things that a tribunal normally orders. Is that something that could have an impact on how a technology dispute is resolved? Look, um, one of the things is that large tech tends to be risk averse so in terms of in terms of its uh, involvement in large arbitrations uh, think you may want to think that they really must be pushed to the absolute limit before they actually enter a full scale dispute uh, but i did want to step back for a minute uh, to answer a couple of points or just to add to what shreya said so look i think you know as we sit and talk about you know what concerns tech companies might have there are a couple of points uh, you know, for instance, AAA ICDR has exactly what we're saying. It has tech uh, panel experts. Uh, there seems to be certainty. There's a legacy over a number of years, decades of doing this, right? But what about amplification, right? Uh, you'd be surprised because there are experts sitting here and therefore there is a sophisticated conversation around choice of uh, arbitral rules, venue, chambers. You'd be surprised at how elementary that discussion becomes when you have 20 points and you need to close a contract. It's, uh, it really is sometimes completely unscientific. There's no hesitation in admitting that. People want to choose a jurisdiction because they don't want the other party's jurisdiction to be involved. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, there needs to be a slightly, there needs to be slightly um, or more thought from both sides. Our counterparties as well give us uh, fairly broad brush uh, recommendations on what they want on arbitral venues and arbitral rules without really substantiating that with what are the advantages of A versus B. So uh, I'd say amplification of choices and the advantages of A chamber. The second is uh, coming back to what uh, someone said, which is that the digital wallet in India is now the largest with the government of India. So I think all of us here are either practitioners or we work for industry, but who's talking to the government? Who's talking to uh, bureaucrats? I was at a meeting last week in Delhi and I was speaking to a very senior uh, gentleman from a public sector undertaking and the conversation was uh, on, on aspects of, you know, those, that was an entity which deals with EPC contracts and we were, di we were discussing tech contracts, right? Where do the two meet? So um, I reckon we need to also evangelize the advantages of a chamber like this because as Purnima said, uh, I'd actually be really happy if mediations were less meaningless and we could actually resolve a number of things through mediation and move forward and 
uh, you know, there's been some steps on that the government has taken. So as I said, and the last point is that, uh, that from our standpoint, um, so far as the process is concerned, I think we had the impression uh, because of some arbitrations that we'd heard that happened in Singapore and London, that uh, they were quick, they were efficient, there were rules that were met, but I think those have really been far and few between. We routinely see other sides uh, abuse the arbitral process in, in certain chambers and, and that just doesn't work for us. It, it makes us go back with a, with a sorry face to people who we assured certainty, right? So as I said, I think uh, if you're able to resort to a chamber which has a legacy of practice and which the other side has heard of and, and, and is suitably convinced, then of course the conversations become easier and you might not need to go the entire way on the dispute resolution process. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned uh, in context of Singapore, because for example, we see a very often, as we discussed earlier in the session today as well, issues around arbitrability of a dispute are raised and that becomes a means of protracting the litigation. Uh, however, we now see, like for example, in Jude Singapore, there is a very clear legislation in relation to arbitrability of intellectual property disputes. Uh, it clearly outlines that all of these disputes would be arbitrable and sets out the position. So these measures do in fact lead to clarity, uh, but always the challenge remains, which is there. For example, the recent Anupam Mittal versus Westbridge judgment, which has now introduced the composite test for determining uh, arbitrability and looks at both the law of the seat and law of governing the arbitration agreement. And consequently, we may still be there looking at the Indian law. But let me pivot a little bit now and let me come back to you, Purnima, to a slightly different area. And this pertains to the regulation of technology by government. How do you see this play out in context of disputes? Thanks, Ashish. Uh, before I answer that, I just also want to sort of take forward what Saurabh was saying a little bit. Um, sort of when you say chambers, you're talking about an institution effectively, right? So, um, so it's unfortunate that you have a good institution with a good set of rules, but they somehow seem to be abused um, by parties, right? So then it comes down to how much control an institution will have or the secretariat has to sort of rein in the parties um, and that's really the pitch for institutional arbitration over ad hoc arbitration. And I think there's a conversation that, that needs to be explored for review of rules regularly by uh, institutions to say, you know, tech is changing fast, are we reviewing our rules fast enough and, you know, um, a week in technology, maybe years in the context of a construction dispute, are we, are we doing enough to, to modify our people delaying things uh, which will then affect interim measures to whatever extent. Um, so I think that kind of introspection w within the stakeholder community is also important and, and Asta, maybe this is a conversation for another day, but um, maybe that sort of introspection, conversations with stakeholders and, and from your own experiences to say, uh, when has a party gone rogue and, and to whatever uh, context or, and even um, to ODR uh, pr providers in India, uh, you know, how, how can we rein in parties to make sure that this really gets credibility? I think that's an important conversation uh, that we must have. Um, I think the reason why uh, government tech interface is also important is, um, you know, you can't really arbitrate uh, with the government if there's no regulation. And, and India's had its fair share of run-in with big tech. Uh, we've had it in the context of Twitter and free speech. Um, we've had, uh, uh, you know, in the context of geopolitical concerns with, with tech companies, particularly from China. Uh, so we've seen that play out. Uh, and, and those have played out in the public domain under the context of public law or international public law. Um, so I think I just wanted to make sure that we're mindful of that context as well. Um, although India is not a signatory to the ICSID, um, and you know we've had a checkered history with uh, bilateral investment treaties, um, it's worth sort of noting that internationally, uh, there have been cases where uh, companies have invoked um, um, you know, bilateral investment treaties or investment treaties. Um, exit statistics, for instance, show that there's been a significant increase, I, I think more than 25% increase uh, in terms of the number of uh, tech disputes that they are having. And these happen to be state, investor state context disputes. So um, number of them, uh, Google, for example, 
Huawei and Sweden, uh, many. So I think we should be mindful of that context and, and the geopolitical concerns when we talk about tech and disputes. Uh, we're close to 45 minutes, so I won't continue to speak and talk there. Although no, I just want to take a second and, and also share with you, and thanks, Purnima, for that. Um, we meet with, uh, or, you know, our, our leadership meets with the government fairly often, and uh, we've had senior representatives from the government saying, what is it that we need to do uh, to to ease doing business in India, right? Which was uh, which has been something the government's done for 20 years with uh, varying degrees of success, right? But uh, I think you should know that it is it is difficult for large companies like ours to specifically recommend chambers because that's that's going to have an effect that is uh, not fair. That's uh, we're essentially seeking, as I said, the attributes of fairness, technical efficiency or proficiency. And, uh, and certainty, right? So this just brings back the point of what Purnima said about uh, recognizing geopolitical concerns, using that as a leverage with the government when you am amplify, and actually offer this as one of the uh, key offerings from the government to have large companies come in and, and resolve the disputes quicker, right? Um, yeah. Just. No, I think there are flavors there and the government is also coming up with means to see how we can bring in some of these mechanisms in resolving disputes which are arising on account of their regulation of technology. Uh, we heard in the l previous session as well how ODR is also being explored in context of the data protection law. So there are those flavors, but Purnima, you made a point earlier about uh, investment treaty claims uh, arising out of technology regulation. but. Unlike areas where governments have traditionally seen claims where they depart or move away from the international trend, today the international trend, not just in India, but across Europe and other leading uh, developed jurisdiction, is to regulate technology, right? So how does that play out and does that have a role in some of these claims that are arising under bilateral investment treaty? I'm sure Shreyas, uh, who's done more BIT work than I have, will may have something to add. Um, so I think tech, in the context of, of state uh, relations, uh, geopolitical concerns, uh, is not only tech, right? It becomes, uh, it could be free speech. Uh, it, it could be seen as a, uh, a something with a criminal tone. Um, it could be seen as an attack on, on the sovereignty of, of, of a country, uh, especially if the tech is coming from outside. Um, you're talking about fair and equitable treatment um, by this host state and whether that is being met. Uh, um, you know, so there's a whole host of stipulations under international law in that context. So while tech is at the core of it, uh, governments don't necessarily see that they're regulating tech, right? Google and competition law in, in the European context. So if, if you've got such a huge behemoth like Google, um, and, and to, to what extent will it impact rights of people, rights of citizens, uh, and how the government perceives it, um, and, and what will they do to react to ensure that their people are safeguarded, however they're looking at whatever those rights and safeguards may be, uh, these will play out. and and. And again, the cross-border idea of tech comes into force. Contrast that to, say, you know, startup tech that, that we deal with in, in Bangalore every day, where uh, you know, they're willing to have a quick resolution because the company wants to grow and wants to attract investment and don't want to spend time and money uh, in the context of a dispute while they're growing. So tech has a wide range, and, and I think um, at that level, a transnational level, we do see uh, tech being identified with, with more public law issues, which results in the regulation. Shreyas, do you have anything to add further on this? I see government as a client. I see, um, and I've had a client in the Republic of India for nine years or so, and uh, there are 200 other potential clients. Like anyone else, it's a complex organization uh, that requires sound legal advice to function. So I don't think we have to see government as something that is uh, sui generis and essentially different um, in terms of professional engagement. And I think the tone is changing. For example, in Delhi, I was there maybe two weeks ago, about 250 people in the room uh, I can talk about it because I saw somebody pulled up to LinkedIn much later. I, I didn't say anything when it happened. But the point was to map out the obligations under international treaties of the Republic, under investment treaties, under trade treaties, and under tax treaties. 
so that the policy red lines are understood. And you have to involve all departments, all ministries, all states. And India has the three lists. And so the, the governance choices that are made at the federal level, at the state level, and at the municipal level may have may, and may trigger international obligations. But the awareness is simply not there. So I have for long advocated that India needs a permanent position uh, to focus on um, international obligations. Call it an ASG, call it ASG, whatever you want, uh, but, but it, we need to have it uh, rather than have it uh, found splintered in many ministries. Um, and I think um, like any client, if there's somebody with a good idea, uh, they're very willing to listen. So I don't think we should hold back. And the, writing an article in a newspaper is not the only way of communicating. Mm -hmm. we, uh, you can easily communicate. Uh, it's shocking to many, but this is a, India is a democracy. You don't need to have some special access to a minister or a bureaucrat. Uh, you can just write in your thoughts and um, it, it may be considered. Now, interesting, interesting that you mentioned that you need a permanent position within the government to focus on some of these international obligation or issues which arise due to some of the government actions that they take within the domestic sphere in contrast of or, or which could lead to international obligations. Let me pause here. Uh, Purnima had earlier mentioned that we would try to have questions from the audience. We'll once again open it up and ask the audience if there are any particular issues or any questions that you have in context of this topic, technology disputes and resolving them through arbitration. Please raise your hands and let us know. I think it's a post-land session and everybody's... Someone has very helpfully left the mic on my table. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Uh, no, you, you were talking about uh, how big tech is resistant to arbitration and how we need to earn, uh, work for it to earn the respect and all that. But I would also say this is only when it suits them. If you look at any uh, software licensing agreement where they don't want to sue you, they quietly slip in uh, an arbitration agreement only in New York. So it's both ways. What do you have to say about this? Mm. No, no, I, 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 I stand by what I say unequivocally. It's not surprising that a commercial enterprise uh, has thought carefully about its contracts. And uh, if you don't have the bargaining power to deal with that situation, in some countries you might have um, laws such as unconscionable terms and contracts. India perhaps needs such a law. And the angst from which you speak of uh, is also addressed in some countries by saying the B2C contracts will be viewed differently. And so even here we have seen some of the uh, consumer fora ent entertain, entertain matters even uh, despite the existence of an arbitration clause. But that's in the B2C space. But on a, on a com purely commercial arrangement that is B2B, I think there's no uh, getting around the fact that you need to have and build commercial strength to have the negotiating power. But once you have it, to use it. So I, I don't, uh, and, I, and I think the inefficiencies as Saurav has pointed out and many others have mentioned, these are too real. You cannot have a corrupt or a broken system and expect re respect. You cannot have an inefficient system and expect respect. And we, it's a collective responsibility to improve ourselves. And I think now there are many institutions now that are getting born all the time. Every, every, every city has one. Uh, there are entrepreneurs who are creating institutions. There are ODR uh, people who are creating what are hybrids of institutions and rules and technical facilities. So there are many options. It can be very confusing for, for parties who want to choose arbitration uh, to say how and where. And, and so I think some responsible guidance around that is, is very important. Also, just to add there, dispute resolution clauses in standard form agreements and their implications have been discussed in various jurisdictions, a whole body of law that has developed on it. But even within context of India, it depends whether you have faced any deficiency of service or if the technology company is alleging certain, say, misuse of the licensing licenses which have been provided, it depends. But at least in context of India, your 
your ability to take recourse against the te technology company through consumer law is not limited. Arbitration continues to add on over there and becomes an additional facet which is there. Of course, where that seat would be, which institution you use, how do you go about it? It's a matter of relevant bargaining power of the parties. Uh, and then you can obviously depend upon different fact patterns could lead to different ways it works out. Not that I speak for big tech, but uh, just to add to what uh, Shreyas was saying, I think there is asymmetry of negotiating power across in segments. Um, the big tech companies seem to be formidable when it comes to dealing with B2B or uh, B2C, of course. But uh, think about big tech when they negotiate with the government. Uh, there is zero leverage there. Uh, and that's not because there is a, a sophisticated appreciation of business or commercial constraints. It's because the party on the other side is careful, as Purnima said, about not resolving something and bringing it to a sensible point because you know they would, they would get questioned about how they actually got to something sensible. Why did they not follow precedent, however idiotic it may be, right? We've dealt with that several times. So I think uh, the answer to perhaps an asymmetrical position where big tech is in, on one side of the fence versus the other is really only in, as Shreya said, to some extent ensuring that the terms are not unconscionable on both sides. And then there is, of course, the certainty that if there is a redress required, it will come at an efficient and reasonable price across, whether it's a big tech which petitions for it or the other side. So that was just uh, two cents on it. Yeah. Please. I want to just go left field for a second, please, and say that we're, I think, operating at a time when the, the world really needs us to get our act together. India really needs to get our act together. The public sector, the private sector, the professionals, we are not to be competitors to annihilation. We are here to build together. And that sense of consensus is critical. And I think conferences such as this should perhaps also be somewhat result-oriented. Because otherwise, ideas are mentioned, and now that we have Teres and your transcription facilities earlier, it could be an excuse to say, oh, I don't know what they said, I don't remember, we didn't take a note. Now we have all of this. Now, all of this should be able to be resulting in something that is concrete. And I want to point out to two quick initiatives. One, of course, the Arbitration Act amendments people know about. But I'm even more excited by the IFSC. You know, IFSC is an attempt to create a choice of governing law within India. So you may have a governing law India, governing law India IFSC. What should be the constituents of that? India will never have English law on our soil, clearly. What is the alternative? What, how can we recreate the efficiencies of DIFC or ADGM without having the English law element? And the, what, what are the uh, changes that are required, not only to the arbitration or ADR regime, but even the substantive commercial regime, which is what we're talking about. Maybe these unfair terms and contracts act, uh, and anything else that is required. So we're living at a moment where good ideas are critical, they're more than welcome, and I think everybody is listening. So we should use the opportunity fully. We have another question here. Ali, please, if I... Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Ali Amarji. I'm an associate in uh, Link Leaders London office. And uh, thank you first to the panel for your, for your views on a range of topics like confidentiality and arbitrability of disputes. And thank you Ashish for keeping everybody awake after a very difficult post-lunch session. Uh, my question is uh, related to the multi-party element of some of these new tech disputes, for example, uh, with respect to the Binance case, uh, there have been a multitude of parties involved. Uh, it's like a class action uh, kind of scenario. Um, and we see that uh, happening more often in terms of cases in the US where certain stock exchanges have faced litigation uh, in terms of class action. And given the kind of products in the tech space, uh, there'll probably be more of those in the future. And is arbitration really equipped or ready uh, for that in the future? Thank you. No, I was wondering, Asta, if you want to talk from your experience. Um. No, just to, it's a very uh, good question that you raise, Ali. Uh, in the Binance case, as I remember, the exchange had a dispute resolution clause which provided for HKIAC uh, as the arbitration center there. 
And as we see, and the point uh, Purnima made earlier, it's very important to keep developing the institutional rules so as to address these new emerging areas. And I think some of the leading institutions, including MCIA, including AAA, ICDR, they all have consolidation provisions. And I think the, the dispute that you mentioned is fairly novel as that led to a consolidation of large number of claims into a single arbitration by each of the users of the particular exchange. So indeed, arbitration is developing and going in that uh, area to address all these new age issues, even for technology companies when you're entering into multiple contracts with various uh, parties, sort of B2C arrangements where uh, business is entering. Arbitration does indeed offer that solution and could be. Interestingly, in your case, it's not just even arbitration. There is third party funding which is also being applied to the same set of solution to lead to an outcome. So we see a set of consumers who it's not about those consumers taking on a technology giant, some of the other concerns that were raised earlier. A set of consumers coming together being funded to take on a technology giant in and through arbitration as a means. So that's definitely a very good example and a very good situation of how arbitration is addressing some of these new age uh, technology disputes that are now emerging. Just a quick point, many of these cases you'll find 176, 200, 300 uh, you know, respondents. And out of the countries where they're based, Senegal, it's all sorts of places, one of them was in India. Uh, the point I'm making is, which is the alternative to the New York Convention? The Convention of 1958 has now, whatever, 180 plus signatories. And despite some countries such as India having a notification requirement, some countries like Malaysia doing away with it, um, there is simply no alternative. There's a, so the TINA factor, is what is driving these such disputes and every new other industry to arbitration. And it will remain so. I think one other connected point is, I mean, we have to evolve to take this in, into account simply because um, what history has taught us is, say, um, and, you know, if you don't use consolidation or, and procedures to expedite them together and move forward, you may have different outcomes for the same set of facts which you don't want. Um, and it may be difficult to then enforce them. Um, so as tech advances and the number of users advance and you don't want to go to court, um, so then arbitral institutions have to think of ways to say, well, if Uber was to go to arbitration with every user in Bangalore, what are we going to do and at what cost um, and where do we go, right? So that's the co set of conversation that we must be thinking of, not necessarily theoretically, as Shreya said, it, it should be a way forward for every conversation and. Uh, maybe there will be articles that come out of this, uh, but we should definitely find a solution. I think I had mentioned at the start of the session that I'll stop it strictly at 60 minutes and we are there. Uh, unless we have any other questions, last one final question, otherwise we uh, end the session here. All right, great. Th I'll just join me in thanking my the fellow speak speakers here on the panel. Uh, who Nice to hear your views and thank you everyone for patiently listening in the post lunch session for us. Thank you, thank you, panelists and the audience for uh, going through this uh, afternoon session, as everybody's pointed out. A few things for us to take back and something, thankfully, uh, these are the insights from the panel that uh, yeah, I, as an audience, heard. Challenges do exist, uh, wide ranging challenges from arbitrability, scope, expertise, who are who are the panel going to be, who are the arbitral tribunal going to be. Their expertise, composition, cost and time. And I think a few of these challenges are sort of addressed by AAA ICDR. Uh, as Asta mentioned, a broad-based uh, panel, a broad-based pool of arbitrators to choose from. Uh, processes that sort of help in expeditiously coming to a resolution of the dispute. Uh, in addition, I also heard of a tool that sort of helps you customize your arbitration clause for a specific company in a specific sector. Uh, so therefore, an all, all general arbitration clause may not do well for a company and, and AAA ICDR has sort of thought of this to allow for a resolution or allow for a, a more customized uh, arbitration mechanism uh, to be facilitated. In addition, as, as Ali mentioned, uh, challenges to the way forward. Uh, consolidation process. How do you accommodate 200 people, 300 people? 
in that regard, in that sense, uh, AAA ICDR has a survey on its member, um, I mean on its websites, uh, wanting feedback from arbitrators, from practitioners, etc. to uh, evaluate their own uh, rules and evaluate uh, how they conduct these processes. And I request all, all the members of this afternoon session to take a couple of minutes out and fill out that survey if possible and your valuable, valuable feedback will be very much appreciated and useful for us whenever we do use AAA ICDR as a mechanism. Equally, MCIA <laughs> is going to be putting out its uh, rules again shortly mm -hmm. and for public comment and I think that comment will also be eagerly awaited uh, there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.